Ivan from. Uh, he just joined uh, Leap as a Leap Fellow. He's part of the RPA on uh, polarization, segregation, inequality, and he just joined last week. And he was not supposed to talk today, and he just jumped in. And we, uh, the speaker today was sick. So thank you so much for jumping in. And, and uh, uh, I'm, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Um, so I am supposed to work on polarization and separation and inequality, but uh, since I just start, I don't have much to say. And <clears throat> this is why I will uh, talk about something uh, completely different. But I hope at the end of the talk, uh, you find like something nice and maybe having some connection to the RPA. So let's see how it works. Um, so this work has been done in collaboration with my uh, collaborator in the Niels Bohr Institute, University of Copenhagen. Um, and so let me start with the um, uh, motivation and introduction of this. Um, so there is one recent uh, work on uh, something called broken detail balance and entropy production in the human brain. So this is uh, done by a group of uh, people in Princeton. Uh, and what is they do is that they uh, have the data set fMRI for uh, like 590 adults. And then they can uh, record on the state of the brain and they project it into uh, two component, uh, PCA component one and two. And using this the PCA uh, coordinate, right? They can quantify different state of the brain. <clears throat> um, so this guy of thing that I think is uh, um, something that rather standard nowadays, and many of you are familiar with. But they want to analyze this data from a physics perspective, and more specifically from a non-equilibrium statistical physics perspective. And the uh, question here is uh, in um, uh, in this work, they want to look for the violation of so-called local detail balance. So local detail balance is uh, a different name for something uh, maybe more, I have a broad uh, uh, implication, which is a micro reversibility. Uh, so the condition for detail balance is, is uh, given by this equation below here. So basically you have the transition from one state to the other, from I to J and from J to I. And uh, if you have the uh, inflow and outflow equal to each other, the, for every pair of I and J, then this is um, saying uh, to you that the uh, system is reversible at the microscopic level. And um, uh, when these two, uh, the uh, style of the equation are equal, right? Then if you define a microscopic current here, then it should vanish. So the statement of the local detail balance is that it, when you have a continuous time uh, Markov chain, uh, you model the system with discrete uh, phase space, um, then the uh, current is absent for any pair of uh, state. Yeah, so this is the physical uh, statement about the local detail balance. And they managed to check this in this uh, brain data. So what they did is that they compared two scenarios. One is in the resting state and one in the gambling state. In the uh, resting state, um, so first of all, this again, right, which uh, the two coordinates is a two PCA. The color here is the probability distribution, the occupancy, right? Uh, and then the um, uh, length of the arrow here is the magnitude of the current here. So the current defined by this K uh, J to I here. So they see that in the rest state, the magnitude of that current is much smaller than in the gambling state. So one order of magnitude smaller. You see by the length of the arrow. So a quick uh um speculation you will see that I'm and sorry, what, what are the states here i and j each of these uh sorry what is the state i and j i and j here you, you see go from minus six to six here and so it's just a coordinate this is to discretize it into grid and then this is a transition from one brain region to the other something like that and so and then they measure the flow right the, the current here, 
because they can measure the time series you are in the, um, the time series in which one brain region is activated. So that time, um, that occupation time divided by the total time gives you some kind of probability of, in of being in that state. And then they also measure the number of transitions, the number of hope from one state to the other. It gives you this transition rate WIJ. And with that, they do it like uh, uh, computationally, right? The, everything come constructed from the time theory, the FMI here. And then by comparing these two pictures, you clearly see that uh, in different uh, regime, right? Resting or gambling, uh, the brain um, like dissipate different uh, um, level of energy and the current structure is different. You see that in the gambling here, uh, the length of all the arrow is much longer. So actually this means that uh, the detail balance is violet that uh, much stronger here in, in the task, in the gambling state here. And of course, um, this is a, a very interesting work. So uh, from this um, uh, microscopic knowledge of all the current, they can compute the quantity, the so-called entropy production. So the, this is the definition of that quantity. Uh, <clears throat> basically, you can think about it as a measure to quantify how irreversible the system is. So the higher the S is, the more irreversible the system is. And if S equal to zero, which means that all the microscopic current vanishes and the system uh, you restore to detail balance. And what they did uh, in the second part of their paper, so the first part is just empirical analysis, analysis of the data, right? In the second part, they managed to, uh, how to say qualitatively, understand the behavior of the model by using uh, what is known as the asymmetric Sherrington Kirapachik uh, model, which is the model back to the 80s in spin glass literature. And for that the model, this is uh, like a reminiscent to you of the easing model, but with uh, two additional components. One is that this coupling constant here, a uh, random uh, draw from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero, and this is a variance. Yeah. Um, and then you uh, have also the asymmetric uh, interaction. So the coupling uh, from A to B, uh, alpha to beta is different from the coupling from beta to alpha. And with this simple toy model, they can run allow, uh, they can run the local update uh, of the system, computing on the spin configuration, and then repeating the formula I showed you in the previous slide uh, to compute the current. And uh, they compute it for three different temperature. And then they see that uh, it's look at least qualitatively that you can have a high uh, violation of the detail, local detail balance. So which means the, this, the system dissipate more uh, free energy at low temperature. But it's, um, one thing is still missing in this uh, uh, paper is that uh, it does not reach to the qualitative detail level of analysis. And also this model is uh, oversimplification of the uh, human brain dynamic. For instance, is the state of the neuron is not just binary. You cannot just write as a plus one and minus one. <clears throat> and um, the, uh, this, this is why the, um, at the end of the paper, it's uh, also mentioned that um, maybe um, you need to uh, calibrate the model better or you need to find a better theoretical framework to analyze this kind of system. So this- Can I ask a very quick question? So the, the, the rotation uh, direction, of clockwise or anti-clockwise, is that uh, imposed or is that spontaneously occurring? No, no, this is computed. This is computed. And this is a symmetric, so it means that the other solution is equally likely, or is it- No, no, when, when do you have the uh, anti-clockwise and clockwise equally likely, then it's what so-called uh, kick-off condition, then you have uh, local detail balance, and then the entropy production go to zero. If you have clockwise and anti-clockwise different, this is the violation of the so-called kick-off uh, condition, and then 
the system is out of equilibrium. You break the tail balance and then you dissipate uh, free energy. But the question is whether it's more right. likely one way or yeah. yeah. This is more likely one way than the other way. It's, it's a violation of detail value. But, 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 but it could yes. be sorry, but it could yes. be the other way more likely. This can be, but this is just what they plotted, what they get from the data. So it could be the other way. Oh, uh, I but, don't know. What does it depend on? Does it depend on your initial condition or does it depend on your coupling parameters? It depends on both. It, First of all, this can depend on the microscopic coupling constant, but it also depends on the initial distribution. If the system has more than one like a final state, this state, so. Okay. And this is just a one demonstration. Yeah. So of course, it's not a complete picture. You can find another representative picture. So, so a brain at rest is very hot. Mm -hmm. up, but it's like more random state. So in that random state, uh, you don't require a lot of energy. It's mm -hmm. quite natural, right? You normally eat more sugar, eat more chocolate, and uh, drink more coffee when you need to do some computational heavy things. And then you dissipate more energy to the environment and you are at rest. So this is the, just a simple uh, uh, analogy or intuition about this kind of thing. Um, but this really motivated me a lot when I am thinking how can I uh, get a better theoretical framework, at least uh, still a simple toy model, but going beyond this uh, asymmetric SK model. Which I have just a question on this yeah. uh, asymmetric, but if S, if the S alpha and F, S beta commute, then how is it really asymmetric? Because no, the, the coupling is asymmetric. What do you mean by S A and S beta? It's just two scalar. The effect of coupling between S alpha and S beta will just be the sum of at J alpha beta J beta alpha. Right? Sorry? If they if they commute, then the S it's a, they are not the op operator to say commute or not. S A S alpha and S beta are just two scalar. So do you have here just the the sum of a own pair of alpha and beta, and then the each of the sum is just the sum over the scalar thing. So there's no operator here to think about that. Uh, is there any other questions? Well, it also means that the Hamiltonian is not energy conservative. Yeah, this is not energy conservative because the force is not conservative forces. Whenever you have action not equal to back action, so you think in as alpha beta, as how alpha influence beta is different from how beta influence alpha. So the force is non-conservative. Does it answer your question? Okay. So, okay. Another question, those, those upper two figures, right? So those come yeah, from uh, measurements of, uh, of- Yeah, is it come from measurements? So components, I see. Now, uh, there's two principal components used here. So yeah, they only the use two, but they are, of course the data are higher, so they, Project only on two components. Yeah, so what is, for instance, this picture of, of the rest states, would that be different if you linked it to three or four principal components? I don't know. They don't present it in the late paper. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, can I go on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so just before I go into the my work, I just briefly recap about it. Why do we care about entropy production in general? Of course, for physics, it's like the thermodynamic arrow of time and then the second law of thermodynamics. You are interested in that for that very fundamental region. But in a broader view, recently there are a lot of work on entropy production because a broader perspective about entropy production is that you only need to pay some energy, energetic cost to perform some function. So whether this is biological system or this is like a social system to achieve some function, you need to pay some free energy. And then there's a lot of work like, for instance, in order to have a synchronization, like in the circadian clock in human body, right? for instance, in this first work, they show clearly that there is a phase transition in terms of uh, the energy requirement, energy consumption, and the uh, entropy production for having synchronization. So just give you, a, and you can also find example of entropy production in opinion dynamics. 
and in eco and uh, environmental system. So I just want to summarize here that this very specific measure and to be production is something firstly arrived in physics, but now they it is adopted in like few as a topic in in uh, many different contexts because people find it uh, useful. So it's enough uh, uh, introduction. Now let me go to the very specific model that I, I find quite interesting and I start working on that. Uh, so there's so-called uh, recurrent neural network. So recurrent neural network has been used to model many different brain processes like attention, perception, or memory. You can check out these two review here. And the basic ingredient of the recurrent neural network is that you have a network of neuron. So the X here stands for the activation. Uh, you have a decay term, so that not everything go to unbounded. And then you have a non-linear function. So it can be like the common choice is tangent hyperbolic, but you can choose any non-linear function that you like, which have a sigmoidal shape, so that you, you have kind of some biological um, pictures because the response is normally just go for as a kind of sigma model form. So if you put the uh, low uh, perturbation, the system should remain relatively stable. And when you increase uh, the perturbation at some point, it, uh, it starts reacting. So this is why like, people mostly use like sigmoidal function and in particular this time in hyperbolic function for this uh, modeling framework. And so, the most crucial in there, uh, component of that recurrent neural network is that each unit compute its reaction, its response based on the integrated input from all of its neighbor. So you define a set of neighborhood and then as a neuron, you receive the influence from as a neuron in your neighborhood and then you compute it. Uh, you take the non elasticity function here and the, the last uh, part is just uh, some random uh, fluctuations that you can account for using the Y noise. So this framework has been studied extensively. It's uh, uh, no doubt about that, but in the physical literature, there is one uh, uh, classical work by Somplinsky and uh, Prisanti and Soma. So in this work, in order to achieve an analytical understanding of that model, they want one extra uh, assumption. So they assume that the coupling uh, is random. So you have the random couplings, which means the covariant and the variance. And it draws from this Gaussian ensemble with uh, uh, very, uh, very standard statistic with the, the scaling one over n to ensure a sensible thermodynamic limit. And uh, once you get uh, this extra assumption, you can solve the model analytically. This is what has been done in this work, but without the noise. First, I need to mention that. And uh, so this is just uh, now the time series um, for the two regime that you can see if you simulate the system. You can have a fixed point regime or you can have a chaos regime, depending on the standard deviation of the of the couplings, right? So this is the variant of the couplings and this is J is just a standard deviation. If the uh, J is, is um, having low uh, standard deviation, then the system relax to a trivial fixed point. So on the activation decay to zero uh, in long term. But uh, when you increase the heterogeneity in the coupling constant, so when you increase the variance here, then the system uh, start having the chaos uh, uh, behavior, the chaotic uh, behavior, which means that there are the self-sustained fluctuation, like with the ongoing never relax to a steady state. And um, the re only very recently uh, in this uh, paper, like, actually after 30 years from the original paper, people managed to find the boundary between the chaos and uh, a fixed point when you have a, a noise. So when you have a 
Gaussian y noise here. Because actually, when you include this Gaussian y noise, the linear stability analysis uh, break down in the sense that this is the boundary between two phases when you compute by linear stability analysis and spectral graph measure. It's the uh, it's completely wrong because the actual uh, phase boundary between the two is the red one here. And it's just recently computed in this paper using different techniques. Um, so this is the, the general dynamical behavior of this model, right? So I just try to convince you that this model have been understood quite well from a dynamical perspective. And so one actual thing that is interesting is uh, that when people look at the signal to noise ratio, uh, so how much you have the, um, whether the system is sensitive to fluctuation or the system is just uh, very robust when you have fluctuation, uh, when it is perturbed by random fluctuation. And they also saw one actual interesting thing about this model is the signal to noise ratio, so a measure of the capacity to process information is maximal at this critical point. So at the onset of chaos, between the chaos and the fixed point. And this has been puzzled for long why uh, the maximal information processing is right at the critical point. And there is no explanation. And I hope that I will give one suggestion for the answer about this peculiar feature of that model by looking at the behavior of the entropy production. So this, this is everything about the dynamical behavior of that model and some extra implication of its dynamical behavior. Critical, you say that there is maximum information processing and yeah. the signal is going to be very high. But what does that mean? How do you actually measure that? Because it's not clear from your pictures in there. Uh, so here, um, it's not clear from that because, okay, because this is, first of all, this is the actual paper, right? This is another paper and this is another paper. But the idea of uh, simple uh, following from studying this paper, so you put a random perturbation and then you see how the system reacts to the perturbation and then the y-axis is just the signal to noise ratio, the standard measure. And then at the x-axis, you look again the coupling uh, heterogeneity and how the system uh, they react, respond to the perturbation. And you find that the the quite appealing picture that in in biophysics people think that many systems, including the brain, there is a so-called critical brain hypothesis. Everything the information processing <clears throat> is maximally at the critical point. So this is still a long hypothesis, long standing hypothesis. No one be able to have been able to prove that hypothesis so far. Even so many, you, if you search for the keyword critical brain hypothesis, you will see 10,000 of paper. But this is just one example of how people have analyzing uh, this model and give some, uh, let's call it a uh, pre-symptom of this criticality and information processing. Okay. Um, so now I go to the main question. Uh, sorry, uh, this phase diagram that you show here. And okay, the, okay, let's. There, there for mu equals zero. Is it for mu equals zero? And does it change a lot when you have mu non-zero? When you have mu non-zero, you actually have four phases. So this is a uh, more complicated model uh, because when you have mu non-zero, the network actually consists of two parts: the random part, and that you randomize sample from the Gaussian distribution, which means zero and the low rank part, and the low rank part is something like you uh, implant a structure into the random graph. And with that, you have two extra phases. One is not a random fixed point, but a fixed point which is non-zero activity. So because you have mu non-zero, now you, will have a, you can relax to a fixed point which have the mean non-zero. And the second phase, the second new phase is what people call structural chaos. So st structural chaos is something in between a non-random fixed point and chaos. It's located at the boundary between the two phases. We can talk about it in it, a bit more detail, so I, I skip it for the moment. Um, so just to summarize, um, 
almost everything is understood about the dynamical behavior of this model. But there is nothing having done for the thermodynamic uh, behavior of this model. And what I am trying to do is just a very small contribution here. Uh, we want to analyze uh, the thermodynamic behavior of this particular model, understand uh, the entropy production in this model. And the most fundamental question is, can we find a relationship between the dynamic and the thermodynamic? So if you have two phases in the dynamic, chaos and fixed point, do we see uh, two different behavior of the entropy production? Like the, the rest state and the gambling state, right? You, if, you, if you dissipate the energy differently, it's naively you can expect that the dynamic behavior is also different in two regimes. So we, the most fundamental aim we want to find here, uh, we, we want to get here is to link dynamic with thermodynamic. And uh, if we are able to do that, uh, then I think we can solve a class of problem with the same trick. Um, so just quickly summarize, right? When we have this uh, asymmetric uh, coupling, the, then you have broken detail balance and this valid to ask the question, what is the energy dissipation? If we don't have that uh, extra component of non-reciprocity in the coupling, uh, there is no dissipation to study, to look at. So the flow is that everything starts from having non-reciprocal interaction, then the consequently have the broken detail balance. And when we have broken detail balance, uh, we can justify our inches on measuring the dissipation. So, Let's see how we can do that task in this particular model. Um, before going to the entropy production, uh, I just want to quickly show you, like uh, if you look from the microscopic behavior, this is the two phases, but you can of course look at the macroscopic behavior of the model by just uh, studying its autocorrelation function. So through the behavior of the autocorrelation function, it's clearly seen that uh, in the fixed point case, it's also decayed to zero, but in the chaos phase, it's converged to some value. So, which means that, uh, like as a standard list uh, uh, study for that model, for that kind of dynamical system model, autocorrelation function is a good order parameter. But now we will look at uh, the things that we are interested in. So, what about the entropy production? how it behave. So I just compute it, right? I can uh, do microscopic simulation of the model. And this is the uh, definition of the HP production rate. Uh, so I simulate 1000 neuron, and then I compute this uh, entropy production. This is a plot that I found. So in, in the fixed point case, it's decays to not zero, but very small value. Um, and uh, in the chaos phase, so the red curve here is much higher. You see here, it is even logarithmic scale. So one thing just to keep in mind that this dissipate way more uh, higher free energy in the chaos phase. That's a quick question. When you say the definition of the entropy production, you look at the, the heat production of the... Yes, this, this is the heat production because uh, so this equation is for the total entropy production. This is the entropy. It is a sum of the system change in the entropy and the entropy that it's uh, dissipated into the environment. So this is the total entropy production. But at the steady state, there is no change in the system entropy. So everything is just computed for the reservoir. So the the heat that dissipates into the in, uh, environment. Yeah. Um, and so, so the curve here uh, is a numeric, but actually we found that we can also compute it analytically using this so-called DMFT theory. Um, so the main uh, uh, objective, by, like to understand the entropy production, we are able to achieve it using this so-called dy dynamical mean theory. So it's a very well-established framework back to the 70s uh, by like, statistical fin theory uh, physicists. And this is an exact approach in the thermodynamic limit. 
uh, I don't want to go to too much technical detail, but you can think about it as a, you compute the moment jetting function now over the entire set of trajectory. And at the end of the day, you evaluate the action to get the Lagrangian and most uh, fundamentally and simply speaking, you get a 1D effective dynamic. So you start from very high dimensional system, right? You follow this procedure. At the end of the day, you get a single equation, a single but cell consistency equation. And the extra cost that you need to pay is that you need to have uh, something called ether here. So ether here is some kind of Gaussian noise, color noise, not white noise. And the statistic of that noise, it defines cell consistently. So it has some relation to the statistic of the neuron. And this is an effective neuron. It is not the true neuron that we start with in the microscopic description. So this is just a procedure. And but thanks to that procedure, we are able to compute the uh, entropy production analytically, and this uh, fit very well to the numeric. Um, so it's so approved of the validity of the approach. But uh, we are, as I said, we are interested in uh, the behavior at the uh, non equilibrium steady state, right? We want to see the connection between the dynamic and uh, thermodynamic. So if I just plot in front of you two figures, one for the autocorrelation function, one for the entropy, they are in isolation. There's no relation. There's not so interesting. I don't learn any new physics. I just learned how to plot two things and how to compute them. And then, okay, I get a good fit between theory and experiment, but no, uh, how to say, inside, I learned by doing that. So we go to do one extra step. We compute this little formula here. So it's quite cool and I'm really happy with that. Is on the left-hand side, you have the entropy production rate. On the right-hand side, you have the second derivative of the autocorrelation function, evaluated at zero time point. Um, so this is quite simple relationship, isn't it, right? You, you have just uh, two quantities that you uh, are interested in the most for the dynamic. You want to see the autocorrelation function for the thermodynamic. You want to measure the entropy production. And now you are able to link them. Uh, by this sim uh, sorry? Is this a derivation or is it just this is the derivation for sure? This is the derivation. You you can look through the preprint to see the entire derivation, which is rather technical, but anyway, this is the fully derivation. And of course it's a derivation uh, under some condition. I will specify later. On, uh, on the last slide, I was actually yeah, this question, one like the, uh, but here. Mm -hmm. Here, do you, uh, did, did you set the sigma noise yes. zero? No. no, sigma here equal to zero, zero point one. Ah, because so, in the formula you showed, there's definitely- Yeah, yeah. So one there, there's springer. noise here. There's noise here. I'm sorry, I forgot to put it here, but there's zero, zero point one here, noise. Yeah, uh, okay. So this, there is a- What happens here? You set sigma to zero? When you set sigma to zero here, uh, we don't know very well yet. Uh, our, how to say our expectation is that it will not grow, it will not diverge with sigma go to zero, which will convert to some limit. It's quite tricky. We have not been able to verify this uh, intuition yet. But um, this formula, at least valid for any non-zero sigma, no matter how small sigma is, this is the claim. I want to be on the safe side, yeah? And um, uh, one thing is the, also worth to mention is that this quantity, right? The second derivative of this autocorrelation function uh, can be found by solving some uh, equation. This, um, this means that now we have a closed framework we can solve for this autocorrelation function, plug it here and get to entropy production. This equation is quite complicated, but you can solve it numerically. But anyway, this is a relationship between entropy production and dynamical property. And so, so this doesn't, doesn't care about the coupling, so J. 
one the thing about the coupling is hidden here in this formula. Depending on the distribution of the coupling, depending on the network topology, uh, and depending on the, like how do you specify uh, the the connection, right? How do you specify the topology? You will get a different specific form of V. But in the most general form, this is just some kind of potential function, yeah. And uh, you just plug and play. You plug the distribution. You plug the uh, the network topology. You get different V. I'm a bit confused because what exactly is X? X is a position, right? Or X some... is the activation at the very beginning. I we claim that X is always activation, and it's yeah. the continuous variable. But yeah. If they find derivatives of that. This is a the but vector field. This is the time derivative. Yes, but yeah. that will actually be yeah some velocities and that change of uh, of activity, and that you couple to the f. And what is f exactly here? Because how do you actually get a heat? So this is completely unclear. Sorry, so I started with mm -hmm. the. I, that's why I asked the question. Centrifugal mm -hmm. production is kind of a heat. It's a yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, heat normally is like a, a velocity times force or something. Like yeah. That. So, and this so, is the velocity and this yeah. is the force. Yeah. Everything in here, yeah. no so, no trick so, here. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's great, right? <laughs> that, that I understand. But when you go to the next slide, uh -huh. you actually have a, a derivative, a second derivative, the correlation function, which is also x. Now that is actually so. If you go to the derivation, you end up with exactly the same type of formula with velocities and forces. Mm -hmm. if you go, is that true? Is the question? So the question. Uh, let me answer your question. So we start from this formula. Yeah, yeah? we start from that formula, and we end up with just formula. Okay. So there are many intermediate steps in between. But the point is that if you compute. That uh, so this is start with uh, convention if you know it. Um, if you follow that convention, you compute it and you use this effective dynamic. So the claim is the following: the very high dimensional system that you get at the beginning, once you cross grain it into one D, you can replace this equation by the one D equation for that effective particle, and once you apply the formula, the force multiplied to the velocity. For that effective particle, do you end up in, in this yeah. okay. relationship? Okay, so now the follow up question is is X is going to be really important? So the choice of X is going to be all determining, not because you cannot just say I correlate anything with anything. Yeah, sure. So if you say. change the X, you change the coordinate, uh, you need to do the on the coordinate transformation. And then the equations will be different, or maybe it's invariant if you buy a good transformation. But but it's the detail oh, so that particular choice of coordinate mm -hmm. is very nice. Yeah, yes. it's true. Um, okay. Uh, so one thing. Okay, for, sorry. So one thing that is very nice, and I think it's it's the nicest thing in this formula that I found, is that when this second derivative go to zero. And exactly, we can show that at the critical point. So at the onset of chaos, between fixed point and chaos, right at the critical point, this vanishes. If this is vanished, then you plug in this formula, you get the entropy products and equal to one, no matter what noise is. Okay, can be very close to zero, but finite, and then it's independent for, from the noise level. This is the nicest picture, like, feature of that formula. And uh, which means that right the critical point, the level of entropy production is insensitive with the noise. It's quite uh, counterintuitive. I cannot understand it. So if you get a better intuition, you should tell me. But this is from the math. There's, so there's no trick here. You you get this guy equal to zero. Then the only thing you left is just one. So it's a magic. Um, and so. Uh, Okay, now go to the derivation. That your question, right? So the derivation work for any overdam longevity, which means that I start with a tangent hyperbolic. I can start with logistic function. I can start with sinusoid or whatever function. You can reformulate this model as a Kuramoto model, 
which you rely on X, Y model, you will change the form of the V, but you will not change this specific form. This is the uh, statement. And um, the derivation so far work for fully connected network, but there is a standard procedure to extend it to random spot network and also include high order interaction. So this is just a, a little bit on the derivation. Now we will uh, check this formula in practice. We will just be marking it with the uh, simulation. Yeah, uh, sorry? Do you have a, a, a physical understanding of what this formula means because you're connecting these entropy rates with the separate derivative of the correlation? Is there a reason why physically, like, does it kind of tell us something physically about what entropy prediction? I I don't think I have a good answer. So this also puzzle for me too. But um, if if we need to answer it in the spirit of your question, right? So entropy production at the end of the day is velocity multiplied to forces. Maybe, yeah. Maybe one suggestion: if your fixed point loses to be eigenvalue to one, then you are and you have this noise driving your system. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be very close to a random walk. And a random walk, in a certain sense, can also be maximally entropy producing. No, but it's not even maximally this uh, separating uh, entropy here. That's a critical part. It's just, it's just a constant. Yes. It's, it's not a no, nothing maximal and nothing minimal here. It but is a constant. From, apart from the details, is it true that if, if, if you are at a critical line, that uh, there is an eigenvalue one here? There is one eigenvalue uh, equal to one if you do the linear stability analysis okay. of that system. Yeah. But I showed you at the very beginning, right? An alarm message here that when you have the noise term here, no matter how small it is, yeah. it deviates strongly from linear stability analysis okay. and human. But somehow the intuition must be that everything must come from the noise because it works so general. Um, yeah. So something at mm -hmm. the critical point is is driven mainly by noise. Okay. okay. Thank you. I, I I will check it. Thank you. I don't know uh, the answer. There are link in this this formula and the the fluctuation theorems that you have mm -hmm. in uh, stochastic. You mean the, like Jachinsky or? Yeah. Cook? Okay. I am not a big fan of a very big theorem. Because the weak theorem tells you a relationship, but it's too general uh, when you can extract information from it in this particular case. So do you, if you have the entropy production here, what most you can do in that direction is you check whether that theorem hold in this system. Of course, it's whole because we we uh, no way we can break that theorem. Right? This is a mathematical statement. But if we start from that theorem. We don't get this derivation here because the theorem is just say you okay this is the entropy production if you go one way and the other and the ratio about that here it, it does not tell you the exact value so the theorem tells you if you have two distribution of entropy production for the process going from a to b and then b to a then you have a ratio between the two distribution and this gives you the entropy production rate uh, and but here you you see, the, it does not give you the value that we compute from the microscopic theory. And this is the full challenge here. The challenge of, of this work is, can we compute entropy production for a microscopic dynamic and uh, many body particle system? Because if you look at the reviewer in stochastic thermodynamic, mostly you will get a, a like rotor, like or two or three state model, something like that. You will see that. The work has been done mainly, but only for small system. And this may be because it's too complicated to compute force multiply to velocity. I don't know, but uh, we try to do it from the microscopic perspective. But, uh, but everything here is in the field theory limit. Yeah, the it's, it's limit. everything in the large end limit. Everything you derive for the large end limit. And it's produced good result compared to simulation with thousand neuron. So the in the microscopic ODE integration, we do with 1000 neuron and it fit well with the thermodynamic limit.
Okay. Um, so now I think it's, it's okay. So now we will test this formula, right? We have a nice formula, but we need to test it. Otherwise, it does not make sense. Uh, we, uh, before testing it, I just want to remark that uh, uh, one extra feature we can get from this general formula is that we can consider different limit asymptotic cases. So whether we get a very small variance of the couplings, or we get very large variance, or we get uh, something close to the critical point. One thing you don't need to look very much into detail, but you see clearly that uh, when you go from fixed point to clear, the scaling behavior chain. So in the fixed point case, it's just quadratic function. But here and here, you will see it's completely not quadratic function anymore. So it just tells you a simple story that when you go to the phase transition, the scaling behavior of the entropy production chain. And now we will test this prediction. So this is the full pre, uh, test of the prediction. So one first test is how the entropy production chain at the critical point, right? Uh, I think you, you asked about the maximality. There's no maximality here because it's just increasing function. So monotonically increasing function over the entire range of the coupling variance. But as we saw it in the, in the last slide, right? Right, the critical point is equal to one. No matter what the noise is, it's always one. I can show the next slide too. And so below the critical point, it obey exactly the scaling function that we found. So it is quadratic function of the variance, uh, sorry, of the standard deviation and the linear function of the variance of the couplings. And it's equal to one here, and then it go to different regime in the chaos space. It behave like different nonlinear functions, but not quadratic anymore. Uh, and uh, the pi is from the simulation, from the microscopic simulation of the system, and the dash line the theory. So the theory, the equation, right, the linking between uh, entropy production and autocorrelation functions, the second derivative, work quite well. I'm happy with that. And um, now, um, so this picture is for one single value of noise. We can go on to check what happens if you change the range of noise. So here you see again that for three different value of the coupling constant at the critical point, it's always close to one. Uh, this is finite side effect in the simulation, but at least this is fairly close to one that validate our prediction that no matter what the noise is, at critical point, entropy production rate equal to one. And secondly, what we claim, right? Um, for an entire range of the noise, it's only a function of the J below the critical point. So this means that this should be a horizontal line, or no, um, sorry, this should be a horizontal line. So there is no dependent on noise if the coupling variant is small. So for small coupling variant in the fixed point regime, you dissipate the same amount of uh, free energy, uh, no matter what the noise is. The only thing that the, the is important in that regime is the coupling variance. Sorry? In your derivation, where does the one come from? The number one? The, is, the number one comes from. Is it dependent on the X that you have chosen? Like, okay. You so the, the number one comes from the following things. So if you if you do this equation, um, uh, yeah, the force and velocity things, you will have this minus one here. Mm -hmm. And like if you uh, do calculation, you will see that this minus one will go to square. And then at the end of the day, it gets you to one so it here. Depend on the coordinate yeah, it depends on the coordinate. It depends on the decay rate. Okay. okay. So, but anyway, it's a constant. Yeah. So one may not be a magic number, but a constant. Um, uh, so just to summarize again, right? So for below critical point, the system entropy production is independent from the noise. So it's just horizontal line. And when you go to uh, 
of the curve. The curve here is because it's too high noise and it's break down the calculation. So the calculation valid for up to noise equal to one or something like that. So reasonable noise. If you go noise equal 10, then basically the system become random worker. Yeah. So all the thing is just uh, not interesting anymore. And then um, when you increase the coupling's heterogeneity, right? You see that it changed from being uh, flat to have some scaling behavior. So it validates the prediction too. And uh, the last thing I want to tell you is that, okay, so this system, I showed you the phase diagram at the beginning, right? The phase diagram for this system has been contracted using the standard measure, so-called Lyapunov exponent. So a measure of the divergence in the trajectory. So you have a different in the trajectory at the initial, uh, initial time, and then you measure how they become more different in the future, right? And then the Lyapunov exponent is just the rate of divergence. And using that uh, measure, they have the phase diagram. And we want to use another measure because we are like statistical physics. I like the Lyapunov exponent, but we want to think whether we can use the entropy production as an alternative measure. So we don't claim that it's a better or like worse measure than the Lyapunov exponent but it gives uh, another order parameter for this kind of system. And because um, in, in a number of paper I showed you at the beginning, right? They also saw that entropy production is a good indicator for, for instance, synchronization, like uh, um, PT symmetry or topological order system, and also some other system which have the uh, so like spon spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism. But in this model, there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking. So we just think whether we can use entropy production here for this kind of system without like any intrinsic uh, symmetry feature. And we found that, okay, it's a, it's look good at least when I multiply it to the noise intensity, um, I see the smooth uh, phase transition from the fixed point to the chaos in agreement with what predict by the Lyapunov exponent. So if you look at the behavior of the Lyapunov exponent, it's more or less the same. It is zero uh, when you are in the fixed point and it start becoming positive at the critical point. So this picture is just to tell you that the entropy production rate can be a good candidate for measuring, for quantifying phase transition in a system without any symmetry. Uh, broken uh, mechanism. So I think I can end up my story here and I hope it's a, uh, like in a reasonable amount of time. And let me summarize that. So um, we have a few uh, take home messages here. We first see a change of the scaling behavior of the entropy production when you change the heterogeneity in the interaction matrix. And to answer the, uh, like not even to answer it, give some suggestion for the answer to the peculiar picture about the optimality of the information processing capacity uh, and the critical brain hypothesis. We saw one thing that the, the optimality is coincident um, with the non-independent behavior of the entropy production rate. So it is one or it can be a constant. But at this point, the system dissipate an amount of free energy independent from the noise. So maybe it's, uh, it is why it become optimal. It's not sensitive to noise anymore. The system is really robust. It consumes the same, uh, uh, it dissipates the same amount of energy uh, or it consumes it um, no matter what noise is. And this explains why it's the optimal right at that critical point. And uh, so the second, um, the, Third point is that we compute this entropy production for the first time as far as I know in continuous time dynamical system because previous work is like computing the corner group C9 entropy, not this entropy production of uh, statistical physics. And um, the last thing is that so we uh, like advocate for using entropy production as a new type of the parameter. So classical or the parameter theory is always associated to some uh, broken symmetry. Here we try to promote that 
Now, if you look at this entropy production, this can be more universal. It can indicate the phase transition too. And uh, for future work, we are happy to discuss with you. Like if you have some interesting system in mind, like no matter if it's social or bio system, we can try to apply that. And uh, we can generalize to different network architecture. And most importantly, can we verify that prediction in some real experiment? I hope that if I have like a very idealized data set, like how much chocolate or sugar you are eating, so I, so that I can measure the energy, and then I can try to verify the prediction of this uh, model and calculation. But uh, so far, I don't have any data. So if you know the data, just tell me and try to test this on real data. Because what people have been working in uh, biophysics, for instance, for many systems, they can measure the amount of ATP. So this is why most of the work on entropy production now is still in the uh, reason, in the scope of biophysics. They can measure the ATP and then whatever model they get, they can validate it. Here I have a model and calculation for the brain, but without being able to to extract the energy consumption, and there is no way to test this in reality. So I hope I can get some data somewhere. If you know, let, tell me. Thank you. Yeah, of course, this will only work if you have this neural model, right? No, it's actually work for any network model. You see the structure is is recurrent, uh, recurrent neural network. It's a very universal tool. It's basically stand for a very broad class of dynamical system. When whenever you have an interaction matrix, yeah. So for any class of network dynamical system, obeying like overdam Langevin dynamic, this would work. So it's not that limited uh, by by saying that it's only work for a neural network. If you replace a uh, neural network here by like gene regulatory network or like uh, ecosystem with trophic level, you can play the same uh, procedure. So this is why I think this is quite how to say flexible in general framework. And at the end of the race again, because you are interested in the derivation it will only change the specific form of the potential here. So it, it changed the way the system moves, right? The equation of motion differently, but there's, there must be the link between the entropy production and the dynamic. And hopefully it looks like what we, we just proved, yeah. Maybe I'd like to uh, can I ask a technical question. So you, you mentioned this potential in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is V. What exactly is it? I mean, is that coming out of the theory or is it coming out of the derivation of, of the DMFT? Of the DMFT. So you do the DMFT equation and then you get to that uh, effective, dynam effective dynamics. On and the then you compute the equation yeah. of motion for the autocorrelation function. Yeah. So you also do it the other way around. If you have an effective dynamics, you can actually apply this whole method. In any, any so of course, if I have the effective dynamics, then I don't need to do that uh, procedure. I jump directly here. So which means that if I have a 1D system, I can already plug and play. I don't need to do all the derivation. So this, this there is going to be not trivial. I, I would not say that because everything can be very complicated. But the point that um, we want to think not only about neural system, we want to think about many body particle system in general. Yeah. So agent exactly. bay models, yeah, that's uh, for where instance. I want to go to. This applies then also to any many body system, no? Yeah. So if you so the first step is to get effective dynamic, right? According to the procedure we extracted, and when we get the effective dynamic, we get this relationship, and when we get this relationship, we can see whether this entropy production tell us something about whether the brain is stressed or is gambling. So we just want to, like, still not a very uh, quantitative level because we don't have data to test it yet, but the prediction is clear. Uh, we can distinguish different behavior 
depending on the level of entropy reduction the system produces. Mm -hmm. Very good. A uh, follow-up question. So, I mean, you said that the, uh, this entropy reduction was uh, really, is actually maximum. Uh, it says no, it's not maximum. It, it's, it's a constant. Maximum. It's a constant. Uh, just as an inflection point. Right. Yeah, it's uh, an inflection point. Yeah, that's uh, that's. So there is no maximality in no in that uh, things, but the maximality coming as a consequence of that fact. So you are independent from the noise at the critical point. So this is why it is the optimal ratio. This is our answer to that battle. Yeah. yeah, just some other, how, how do you know there's no broken symmetry? Be because you don't have like, for instance, you, this is not a physical system which you define with a physical force, right? In the physical system, you, you have a force which you can measure and you, you know, as a, this belong to this class of uh, like, for instance, easing model, you have up-down symmetry, or uh, OAN model, you have rotational symmetry. Yeah. If I tell you that, if you look at this equation, what is the symmetry of this system? I don't, I don't know how to there, there's sort of, but, but that <clears throat> there is <isn't> <laughs> No, there is one, I check the symmetry. If you set it, now I go to zero, then this have the uh, symmetry that if the X is the attractor of the dynamic, then the minus of X is also attractor. So this is the only uh, symmetry that you have. But as soon as you have this sigma, non-zero, you have no attractors. You don't really like to fix point. You only have the steady state distribution. And so there's no thing sensible to talk about uh, symmetry here. And this is why I, I'll claim is that there is much richer class of system in which there is no way to identify symmetry, but you still want to understand the phase transition. So what is the uh, order parameter here? We just suggest that this entropy production is a good one. We don't say that it's a unique one because people looking from the dynamical perspective, the dynamical system perspective, they have the near pull of exponent, they, they have the Kanwagorov C9 entropy, they have the fractal dimension, they have all the zoo of um, uh, measure on it. But as a physicist, we want to have some like how to say more intuitive order parameter. And the entropy production seems to be a good one. I don't say it's a perfect one. Does it seem to be a good one? Does it also link with prediction here? Yeah? Because the Commodore of Sino entropy tells you something about how well you can predict uh, the signal into the future, the average signal. Yeah, yeah, but here it did not like about the prediction of the future because this is like, again, dynamical perspective. Here we, we don't say that, but we can look at this equation in the other way around. So here I know the autocorrelation function, right? And then I compute the entropy. So suppose that now I know the entropy, I can also infer the autocorrelation function. So I can also predict something about the dynamical mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. in the future. One question: How robust the phase transition? Like, because you are arguing about this criticality, mm -hmm. and recent studies they also claim that you oscillate around it because you don't stay. At the no, point. the prediction is that for infinite system, the only stable state. At the beyond the critical point is a chaos, and you have only oscillation, so limit cycle. If you simulate a finite size system, so the the critical point is not sharp, and you have own kind of finite size effect because you you can have limit cycle there in this model. So if you simulate a system here with small system, uh, instead of chaos, you can see limit cycle. It's true. But the prediction is again only valid for this uh, thermodynamic limit. And we only check uh, for the large enough number of neurons so that we can compare the prediction of the theory and the simulation. Of course, if we, if we are able to go to the finite size regime, maybe, maybe we need some correction for this formula. Yeah. We can do finite size scaling analysis for that. Uh, if there are no other questions, maybe we can uh, continue the debate okay. in the questioning in the, in the lunch and then. Yeah.